Could we make a synthesizer in Ruby? What is a synthesizer? It's basically a machine or a program for making artificial sound. We're going to build a particular kind of synthesizer called a subtractive synth. We'll need something to tell us what notes to play and how loud, a way to turn notes into simple sound waves, and something to shape those simple waveforms to create more varied sounds. So the notes we want to play come in at the top of this diagram, and sound comes out at the bottom. If we want to play more than one note at a time, we'll need several copies of this middle section, and we'll mix them all together in the end. Then we send that to our speaker, simple as that. This exercise will help us learn more about frequency, amplitude, phase, waves, and filters. We're going to use the pry command line to experiment and learn, and then we'll put what we learn to use. Let's start with how we generate our basic waveforms. Anything that can generate a waveform is called an oscillator. The oscillator we'll use is a bit of code that can generate different shapes of sound waves. We tell the oscillator what frequency to play and what waveform to use, and its sample method gives us a list of numbers that represent the amplitude of the sound wave over time. Our sound card will expect 48,000 of those samples per second. We can see that the oscillator's output really is just a list of numbers, and then plot those numbers to see the waveform. We can call the oscillator's sample method in a loop and send that to our sound output. Sound cards usually want us to send them a specific amount of data at a time, so we'll generate that much data for every loop iteration. I've got my sound system running at 60 buffers per second to match the 60 frames per second of this video. At 48,000 samples per second, that means each buffer is 800 samples long. I press Ctrl C to stop the loop. Let's put this code into a standalone script where we will gradually build up our synthesizer. Cool. The next thing we'll need is a source of notes to play. Musical instruments and synthesizers typically use MIDI to communicate. MIDI is a stream of bits and bytes that tell an instrument what notes to play and how to modify the resulting sound, such as louder, softer, more reverb, panning left or right, and so on. MIDI can be a lot of work to handle in code. Fortunately, another developer wrote the MIDI Nibbler gem, so we'll read MIDI notes from our sound interface and use that gem to turn them into meaningful data. The important MIDI messages for us right now are note on and note off. So in our synthesizer loop, we'll see if we received any note on or note off events, and if we did, either start or stop our oscillator. Note on and off events tell us the number of note that was played, note 60 is middle C, and how hard it was played, called the velocity. Both of these numbers range from 0 to 127, which is the highest number you can represent in binary with 7 bits. Now let's connect our little synthesizer to an on-screen keyboard and see what happens. We should probably have it start silent. Cool.
Now we can play simple notes. That sine tone is rather boring though. Let's switch back to our command line and try a different waveform. On the left, we're looking at a slice of our wave in time, and on the right, we see the spectrum of frequencies that combine to make up that wave. These are referred to as the time domain and the frequency domain, because the x-axis domain of the graph is either time or frequency. Long ago, scientists and mathematicians figured out that every repeating waveform, including every sound wave we can hear, can be broken down into individual sine waves. This isn't just because of the individual hairs in our ears. This is a mathematical property of waves. Notice all of these extra lines in the spectrum? These are called harmonics. So once again, all sounds are composed of a mix of frequencies. A fundamental tone, roughly evenly spaced harmonics, and for most natural sounds, some extra frequencies that don't fall on harmonics. Here's a comparison of a sine wave, sawtooth or ramp wave, a square wave, and a piano. Notice the harmonics are in the same place for each sound, but their levels and the levels of neighboring frequencies differ. We can gradually add more and more sine waves to build up any wave. This is called additive synthesis, as opposed to what we will be doing, subtractive synthesis. To demonstrate this, before we move on to subtractive synthesis, we can listen to the first 30 individual harmonics in a sawtooth wave, and then hear how they come together to make the sawtooth shape. This first line of code builds an array out of the harmonics, with the harmonics getting quieter with the reciprocal of the harmonic number. We'll use a low-frequency oscillator, also called an LFO, to choose which harmonic we play. This at-rate method tells the oscillator we will be sampling it only 60 times per second, instead of 48,000. And at sets an output range of 0 to 29. Those are our harmonic numbers. We want to start at the lowest harmonic, so we rewind the initial phase by one quarter of a cycle. We'll plot the output just to make sure it's behaving as expected. And this is what we wanted to see. It starts at the bottom and moves to the top twice in the period of 10 seconds. Then we just play the harmonics in a loop, taking 1 60th of a second for each one. The sinusoidal wave generated by our LFO means we'll dwell on the lowest and highest harmonics for longer. That's all well and good, but it doesn't really sound like a sawtooth wave, does it? Well, let's start playing the harmonics together. You'll be able to hear each new harmonic as it's added, but you'll also start hearing the overall tone and timbre change to be more and more like the sawtooth wave. And here, rather than taking a single harmonic, we're taking the list of all harmonics from zero to the output of our LFO, summing them, and then taking 1 60th of a second worth. Nice. Notice how with each harmonic that gets added, the wave gets closer and closer to resembling our sawtooth wave. So why don't we use additive synthesis for everything? One downside of additive synthesis is that it's hard to control musically. This is why subtractive synthesis is popular. 
For a subtractive synthesizer, we start with waveforms that already have a whole bunch of harmonics. Then we use something called a filter to subtract any harmonics we don't want, and emphasize ones we do. We're going to use really simple filters that come in just a few shapes, low pass, high pass, and peaking. There are also a few other common types. These can be combined to make just about any shape of filter you might need. You can think of a filter as like a colander for sound. The shape of a filter, which is analogous to the holes in the colander, passes through sounds we want and blocks sounds we don't. A high-pass filter passes through smaller waves and removes longer waves. A low-pass filter does the opposite, and a peaking filter makes a narrow selection of frequencies louder or softer. A filter can be characterized by its impulse response and its frequency response. These are sort of analogous to the size of the holes in a colander. The impulse response is the shape that comes out of a filter when you send a single spike or impulse through it, and that shape relates to which frequencies are removed or amplified by the filter. The frequency response shows how much louder or quieter each frequency becomes after passing through the filter. On top of changing the relative loudness of different frequencies, filters also delay some frequencies. In my previous video, we learned that delay and phase are related. Delay is measured in units of time, phase is measured as a fraction of a circle, but they both represent a shift of a wave. Let's look at our filter's frequency response again. The frequency response is actually a complex number. The magnitude of that complex number, that's the distance away from the origin, gives the change in volume and the angle gives the change in phase, which relates to delay. So we've seen that we can choose a filter's type and the filter's center frequency. There's also a quality or Q parameter for filters. For low pass and high pass filters, the quality controls how tall of a spike to make around the cutoff frequency. The gain at that frequency is the Q factor. Q is also very roughly the number of visible ripples in the time domain after a big jump in the input. So let's add a filter to our synthesizer along with a way to control it. A lot of synthesizer keyboards have a modulation wheel. This gets translated to a MIDI control change message with control number one. Similarly to note on and note off events, control changes range from 0 to 127. And I'm just converting that linear range from 0 to 127 to a logarithmic frequency range for our filter. The filter's not going to do much until we change our synthesizer's waveform. I'm going to change our synthesizer's tuning reference from an A440 to a B480 so that the waveforms will be stationary on the screen. Now because of the way I'm recording this video, I need to send the filter's impulse response to the audio output so it can be displayed on screen. Normally you wouldn't do this. Now we can see our filter's frequency and impulse response, and we can see the effect that it has on the sound we're playing. Since we only have one oscillator, if we try to play more than one note at a time, then only one will sound. Notice that you can see the impulse response and frequency response of the filter reflected in the sound output. Okay, back to the code. Right now we can only play one note. In order to play more, we just need to create multiple copies of our oscillator. To keep from overloading the processor and to keep the sound from getting too loud, we'll limit our synth to eight voices of polyphony, or eight notes we can play at once. Anytime we try to play more notes than that, we'll just stop the note that's been playing the longest and reuse that oscillator. Normally you'd create a new filter for each voice as well, but we'll stick with just one filter for now. I wrote this beforehand, now I'm just going to type it in here. If we were just using oscillators in a loop, we could store them in an array and use a cycling index. 
but since we want to use any silent oscillator first, and then if there isn't one, use the oldest oscillator, and reuse oscillators of the same note first, we need something a bit more sophisticated. This logic for deciding which oscillator to take over is called voice stealing, and it can get way more complex than what we're doing here. Anyway, let's create a class to keep track of our oscillators. After that, we'll sum the outputs of all the oscillators and send the result to our speakers. So that's how we can make a simple synthesizer in Ruby. Where can we go from here? Production synthesizers are vastly more complex than what we've built, but at their core they use many of the same building blocks, oscillators and filters. The source code for this synthesizer is available for download so you can extend it. Maybe you'll add an LFO or an envelope generator or an echo effect. If you do, be sure to let us know in the comments. So today we learned more about how oscillators produce different types of waves, how waves are made up of many frequencies, and how filters change amplitude and phase. We'll apply these concepts to future sound projects, including our surround sound decoder. It takes a long time to write the code for and produce these videos, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and comment below if you have any suggestions. Thanks for watching.